Und äh, wir kommen zum Thema Machine Learning und Cloud. Uh, der Titel lautet How Machine Learning and Cloud Technology Turns uh, Plastic Manufacturers into Data-Driven Powerhouses. Und dazu wird sprechen, nicht wie angekündigt im Programm der Alexander Schalupka, sondern Dr. Nikolas Ecke von der Firma Netsch. Und ja, ich bin gespannt auf Ihren Vortrag. Bitte schön. Ja, vielen Dank. Um, thanks a lot for joining me today. I'm going to do this presentation in English just to be a little bit more inclusive. Um, so today I want to talk to you about our digital mold solution, how it enables plastics manufacturers to be more transparent and more uh, efficient in their processes. Um, before I get into the technical aspects of things, I'd like to briefly explain to you who we are, where we come from. Um, so if you are from the plastics world, uh, you may know Netsch as a supplier of thermal analysis equipment, especially our sister company, uh, Netsch Analyzing and Testing. And since Expert was founded two years ago with the intent of taking this knowledge that we have in the laboratory environment uh, with you know, defined material analysis, material characterization, sensor technology, and take this knowledge from the lab into the production environment. And the way we do this uh, is shown here. So we uh, use sensors, dielectric sensors, that can be mounted in the plastic production tool, in the mold, and characterize the material while it is um, taking its shape and uh, hardening. And these sensors are connected to an edge device that is performing the measurements and also collecting data from the machine if it is supplied. Um, and then feeding this data into a machine learning model. Um, this machine learning model allows us to uh, determine if we have reached our quality criteria, for example, a target degree of cure, the target uh, glass transition temperature, and then um, we are able, oh, is this not working? Um, we are able to feed this information to the shop floor uh, team, allow them to see, you know, are the, the quality criteria met already? Do we have to maybe adjust our process? And of course, we can also um, uh, suggest these uh, adoptions to the process, to the machine automatically. The data is then, after the production cycle has been finished, also fed into a cloud environment where it is accessible from anywhere in the world, as long as you have internet access, of course. And um, here, the, uh, the user is also able to define a customized dashboards, set quality criteria, you know, process envelopes, basically, um, and see if this has been met. And of course, achieve uh, alerts also in this case, because we can see the entire production for as long as the installation is running, um, detecting long-term process drifts and um, correcting for those. Another purpose of the cloud environment is also the retraining of the machine learning algorithms. So the edge device that we have in the shop floor is not powerful enough to do this all on its own. And so um, the, the retraining of machine learning algorithms is going to happen uh, in the cloud environment. And all this combined gives us uh, an, a solution that is really process agnostic. So you can use this in injection molding, in autoclave uh, processes, in RTM. Uh, so really, the, uh, the majority of plastics and composite production um, is something that we can cover. So let's look a little bit more into detail um, regarding how this works. Um, the sensors we use, as I mentioned before, are dielectric. So this means we basically have a little capacitor and the, the material, the plastic, is going to act as a dielectric. And we apply an alternating voltage and the material is going to react because in the, in the plastic you have macromolecules that have you know, charge carriers, dipoles that can orient within the electric field. And this is something that we uh, can then detect and conclude um, you know, how, how easy it is for the molecules to move, essentially. And from this information, we can then infer uh, to various you know, material properties and also quality indicators, such as the viscosity of the material, degree of cure, TG, um, 
and also, uh, for example, um, influences on the material, such as aging. Um, I'll give you a few examples also later on. What we basically see is uh, a dielectric response. So this is indicated by um, this, this blue dashed line here. Um, when we um, uh, apply some, well, in the process, apply some temperature to the material. So the plastic will see uh, an increase in temperature. The first thing that happens is the viscosity decreases. The plastic becomes more fluid. And this is what we see when the, when the dashed line is dropping. At some point, we reach a minimum, and then this, this line goes up again. What this means is the material is starting to react. There's a chemical reaction occurring, and the material is uh, hardening, right? It's curing. And this is something that we can detect. And then at some point, this effect is stronger than the decrease in viscosity because of the temperature increase, and that's where the line starts you know, moving up again. And then at some point, our curing reaction is nearing its finish, and that's where we reach that plateau in the end, which is indicated by point number four here. So that's when we know, okay, we are almost ready with our curing. At some point, we can uh, define a, a quality criterion where we say if we have reached this level of cure or <coughs> you know, correlating um, measurement uh, level here, then our part is finished, it's good, and we can demold and have our finished part in good quality. Um, and what we do with this measurement is we take the dielectric measurement data, we combine it with uh, some material science, basically, so kinetic models and uh, other information that we take from standardized lab experiments, and then we combine this into a machine learning model that has you know, laboratory knowledge, uh, the, uh, material science, but also the real-time in-mold measurement that occurred during the production inside the mold. So we're really looking into the mold as the part is taking shape. And we combine this into a machine learning model that is then uh, used for real-time process control. And this machine learning model then allows us to not only trace uh, the data as it occurs during production, but also to look into the future. So in this case, what you can see is uh, the, uh, the blue line, which is our ground truth, basically. So this is what really happened during one production cycle. This is the curing reaction as it happened in one uh, part that we made. And uh, the, the dashed line basically is our real time. So this is now, right? As, we, as the production uh, happens, we are moving through time through this production cycle. And the, uh, the green line, the dashed green line, represents our prediction based on what we have measured. And what, we, what you can see here is that about one third into the production process, we can basically uh, predict what the outcome is going to be, right? In the beginning, there's, you know, it's shifting back and forth a little bit. But once we are about one third of the production of the cycle time into the process, we can predict what happens um, in really good quality and basically know beforehand when the part is going to be finished, when it's going to be good, and when we can demold and end the cycle. And then after the cycle has been finished and we have produced a good part, we are going to upload this data into the cloud uh, to be able to learn from it, improve the, uh, the models as production moves on, and also, um, of course, to enable our customers to take a look at their production, also see long-term trends, uh, production drifts. Um, and of course, we want our customers to be you know, the master of their own data. So um, besides from being accessible from anywhere, we also provide uh, APIs for our customers to integrate this data into their own um, you know, data management or analysis systems. And in the end, um, you know, these are basically the, the uh, ideal predictions, but what we have realized up to now is uh, scrap reduction and cycle time reduction in significant quantities. Um, and also these lead, of course, to, um, to uh, ecological improvements of the entire process. And there are also side effects, such as you know, reducing uh, machine downtimes due to you know, looking for a problem uh, that we cannot really uh, identify. That's where this increased transparency of the entire process is really helpful. 
And of course, we have documented quality, right? We, can, we have a way to measure and document the quality criteria have been met here. Um, I'd like to give you a really brief uh, introduction into the material science of things, how, you know, what is it that we actually detect? Um, so one influence, for example, that we can have on the material is shearing. So while we're producing the parts, the liquefied plastic is pressed through really thin channels from some kind of, of uh, plasticizing unit into the, the actual cavity where the part is being formed. And during this flow process, the material is sheared, right? Parts of the material flow uh, with, with different um, velocities and that leads to shear. And what we can see is, again, where the, the, the area where the line is rising, so in the center basically, that's where the, the plastic cures, that's where it becomes solid. And what we can see is that this process is much faster uh, if the shear is higher. So in this case, we have three different injection speeds, two seconds, about four seconds, and six and a half seconds. And if we have faster injection speeds, we're pressing the material into the mold faster the shear is higher, right? The flow conditions are more extreme, and this leads to the reaction kicking in earlier and going faster. Um, and so, you know, this just is meant to illustrate how um, deviations in your, in your production, in your machine settings, are going to change the way the material behaves in, in production. Um, besides uh, the, the injection velocity, it's also depending on your, um, on your flow path. So the, the little channels that the material needs to flow through, are those thick, are those thin? If they are really thin, again, shear is higher and the reaction is going to kick in faster. Um, as you can see here, for example, so in this thin channel, everything is shifted a little bit to earlier times. Um, and so as expected, um, if we have a very thin uh, flow channel and fast injection speed, the degree of cure, if we have a fixed cycle time, fixed you know, processing time for the machine, um, we are going to reach a higher degree of cure. More chemical reaction has happened up to, up to that time. Um, that is expected behavior, but here we have now a means to quantify this and you know, uh, control our machine based on that information. Another influence that we have is batch-to-batch uh, -batch variations. So each bag of material that you receive from the manufacturer is going to behave a little bit different because, of course, they have production uh, deviations of their own. Um, also, the storage is going to maybe have been a little bit different. Uh, maybe the, you know, Maybe the truck that has been transporting this material has been driving through sunshine. Maybe it has been driving through rain. All this is going to influence the behavior here. And so if we throw two different batches of material, two different bags basically, into our uh, plastics uh, manufacturing machine, we are going to see a different behavior. As you can see, in some cases, if we have uh, high injection speeds, uh, the entire production, uh, the, the reaction is shifted to faster behavior. If we have slow injection speeds in the first place, um, the reaction kinetics are slower. So this is really an influence that is hard to point down, but here we can actually measure it and react to it. Um, and I mentioned storage before. So this material is aging, even if you uh, have not produced it, uh, you know, used it in production before. So if we take a fresh bag of material, um, sorry, do an experiment with it. We see the curve here, day one. We do the same, exact same production cycle one week later, uh, and we have a different behavior, right? The, the reaction happens faster. Four weeks later, even more fast. And that's because the material is already starting to react very slowly, but it's happening. Um, and this, of course, first of all, leads to a different, you know, different kinetic, different uh, dynamics in our production process. But it is also going to influence the, uh, the properties of the final part. It may be more brittle uh, and, and things like that. So with this knowledge, what can we do with it? Um, one example I want to give you is uh, a, a use case from the electronics industry. So we have a circuit board uh, that is used in electromobility. And these circuit boards need to be encapsulated. So they are um, cast on, 
with a plastic uh, in order to, to protect them from environmental influences, from moisture, from vibrations, right? Um, and this plastic that we are using in those processes is uh, an epoxy resin, so this is a reactive polymer. Um, and in this process that takes you know, around uh, three minutes, um, this is what we see. So we have the, the curing time, which is the time uh, um, that the machine or the, the part is, is subjected to the heat and production. And we have the final degree of cure that we determined in the laboratory. So we took those finished parts, did some laboratory tests, determined the degree of cure. And what you can see is that, first of all, we have, sorry, we have a significant scatter in the degree of cure of the final parts. So really the parts that we produce um, are going to have different properties. And also um, the curing time is a little bit different. Um, that, that was, you know, the time from the, um, from the minimum in this, in this curing curve that we saw before uh, to the demolding. And so there's definitely potential for improvement here. Um, and what we did is we applied our machine learning model here, uh, did a prediction, and what you can see is that um, the, first of all, this, this prediction works very well. So we have a, a, a relative deviation of the prediction and the actual uh, degree of cure uh, within like plus minus 0.5 percent and what this in the end allows us is um, to basically remove the scatter here, right? So if we want 90 percent degree of cure, this is our good criteria, right? If we reach 90 percent, our part is okay. First of all, um, we can cut down on all these, uh, you know, these processes that are taking too long, right? So this is the shortest time that we have ever had in a part where we have reached the quality criteria. Everything else are processes um, that are taking longer. So setting our process time somewhere back here gives us a stable process, but it's going to cost us a lot of time. So what we want to do is set our process time, our default process time here, and just adjust it when it's necessary. If we see the part is going to take a little bit longer to become good, then we do an adjustment. And in the end, um, you know, this allows us to produce some more parts and also still uh, have zero scrap production. And in the end, so if we, if you look at the possible savings here and the uh, the investments, so this is the per year cost of our uh, solution, you have a very very rapid. Um, uh, return on investment in this in this case. So this already concludes my technology overview. I want to give you a little uh, outlook. Up until now, I've talked about reactive systems, right? Polymers that do a chemical reaction within the mold during the processing. Uh, so those are thermosets and those are rubbers. We are currently moving towards thermoplastics, which have um, you know a very different behavior and different. Um, uh, different problems that pro, um, processors typically encounter, but still the solution, the measurement technique is applicable to these materials and we are currently working hard to make Sense Expert Digital Mold available also for thermoplastic processes. Um, and of course, if this looks interesting to you, um, I'd love to have a chat. Uh, come visit us at our booth or get in contact later on. So thank you very much. <laughs>